Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! On Europe, all British journalists have been beaten about the head and ordered to make the referendum very, very interesting and exciting. A good job done on the front page of the Mail on Sunday in that regard. They've got uh, Boris Johnson's sister, Rachel, telling the inside story of that great conversion. Tennis, a tipple and British bangers. My part in Boris's EU bombshell. And it's a very good reading, so we'll talk about it. And the headline, Meltdown, very, very dramatic, which translated means that Philip Hammond has been mildly disobliging about Sir Bill Cash. Slightly of the top chaps. Um, the Observer. How often do you see the word limbo in a headline? Brexit would spark decade of economic limbo. It sounds quite kind of calm and reassuring to me. Um, Sunday Times, their Tory threat to oust the Prime Minister after the EU vote, and that's whichever way it goes. We'll certainly be talking about that with Tom Newton Dunn and others. And the Sunday Telegraph there have both Ian Duncan Smith, who will be joining me shortly and uh, David Cameron, who was here last week, making their case. So, Europe, Europe, Europe. We have other things to talk about, too, but we are going to start with Europe. Jim? With Europe, right, so on the front of the Sunday Times, we've got this story that David Cameron is going to face a challenge, no matter which way the vote goes. And we've got four months of this to go still. So, blue-on-blue blue attacks, as Tory-on-Tory Tory attacks, they're going to start coming up and up, although you're not necessarily going to see them on TV debating each other, because they're desperately trying to avoid that. Cool. But we've also got Sir Linton Crosby, the man who won the election in many respects for the Conservatives, warning that he had given advice saying, don't go about it this way, try and delay it for a year, try and rubbish the deal and go we back to something else. We wanted a kind of theatrical else. walkout this year and then return to negotiations and a deal in 2017. Exactly. And yeah. it looks like, you know, at the end of this, four months of campaigning within a party, you're going to have some people who have been burnt very badly and they're going to be looking for someone to take it out on. How seriously do we take the idea that David Cameron will face a challenge? Because he sat in that very seat not so long ago and said, I'm not going anywhere, whether we win or lose this referendum. Well, he's still only got, you know, you only need 50 MPs to make a challenge, and there's 100 odd who've come out for Brexit. So if a few of them are disappointed, then I'd have thought there's a pretty good chance that he'll get a challenge. I think there's every chance, no matter what happens, uh, simply because there's been a few people now hanging around on the back benches who perhaps were in cabinet before who do really want him gone no matter what. I'm Liam Fox. Like Liam David, Fox, David, perhaps David. Owen Patterson. Two people who already refuse to pledge their support to David Cameron if he loses the referendum publicly. Uh, but also, it's, it's the way he appears to be going about this. It's the substance as, as well as the style. So Cameron has been uh, telling everyone, please, no blue and blues, let's have a civilised debate in Cabinet. And then he goes straight out and bashes Boris Johnson round the head. And interesting, I, I discovered from David Owen this week, who I interviewed, that this is absolutely not what Harold Wilson did in 1975. He apparently remained above the fray, was the objective mm -hmm. character who said, well, whatever which way Britain goes, I will go with them, and allowed his more junior ministers quite cleverly to have mm. this fight for him. But there is that sense that everybody's getting quite rattled already, and we've got an extraordinarily long way to mm. go still. Um, I mean, so this was the, the interesting uh, piece in the Mail on Sunday today. Um, we've got Philip Hammond, who's, who's come out, and uh, in, in a state of absolute fury, there was a, a foul-mouthed attack on uh, Bill Cash, uh, who he called a total S star, 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 star. Um, and it's very interesting, this blue-on-blue -blue attack. And, 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 and the of course, fury we are all hyping it. it up a bit. Of course. I mean, According to this, the uh, onlookers were absolutely shocked and appalled by it. They never they, heard words like which, that. Which, I know, which makes you think they probably ought to get out more often if that's. Uh, but um, but it, but it is this idea that this is this fueling tension and George Osborne's uh, also fury at the, the idea that Boris Johnson sure. putting him up as a James Bond character. Indeed, well, turning directly to the James mm. Bond character, a little insight into the domestic life of the Johnson family in a mm. rain-drenched yes. farmhouse last weekend. A, a, a truly wonderful read uh, by Rachel Johnson, Boris's sister. Never one, it must be said, to miss an opportunity to write a lot and perhaps yeah. gain a substantial fee from the Mail on Sunday for uh, the inside <laughs> account. Uh, uh, all the Sunday papers are sprinkled with um, uh, Boris Camp versions of events. All of them go along the lines of, this wasn't about a, a leadership decision, this wasn't no, no, cynical, no, no. absolutely not. Sun on Sunday has it that Boris was uh, filled with this sort of rush of patriotic blood to the head when he heard Emma Thompson, the actress, have a go at, you know, <laughs> cake uh, sodden Britain, which was the thing that sort of this made him This becomes more surreal by the second. It does. 
Uh, Rachel Johnson, uh, we, uh, I had to say this piece is largely about how it's all about principal Boris rather than um, Machiavellian mm. Boris, but it's a fascinating, so you drove down to Boris's house in Oxfordshire last Saturday when the cabinet was famously meeting after the Prime Minister came back with a deal and Boris was still in agony, his mind was flashing like a traffic light, says, says Rachel Johnson. They went up going outside to play tennis in the rain to try and calm him down, then he remedied burnt the sausages inside and mm. it, it goes mm. on, it's a lovely, and inside it all of course is this great, uh, uh, forget the, the world world's dilemma on Brexit. There's also the Johnson family dilemma. So you have you know, Stanley, the farmer, the former MEP, uh, remaining in. Rachel admitting she's going to vote for in. Brother Joe Johnson, the university minister. Mm. Uh, but uh, Boris's mother is a recruit for uh, Brexit, we also learn. So the family is splitting, yeah. a bit like the nation, not quite down the middle, yeah. but certainly splitting. There is an interesting line um, as well, where she says that uh, she put to Boris the pros and cons of his career, depending on what, what he should do. But uh, he wasn't interested he wasn't in that for a moment, and that gets about one paragraph in about 2,000 word <laughs> uh, piece. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jim, um, I think a first for our newspaper review, because it's not a newspaper, it's BuzzFeed, it's your bu organisation. Now, my kids, who are now in their 20s, they're not yeah. children, they get their news from BuzzFeed. Are they safe? Are they safe? Yes, we're, we're a very reliable and uh, serious uh, news organisation. We have our fun stuff, but we also do stories like the uh, tennis match-fixing scandal, which we broke the other week. So, yeah, it's a, it's a nice mix of light, mm. and, uh, light and shade like any other paper. And you are their political correspondent. You That's work, it, as it were, in the lobby alongside all your newspaper colleagues in exactly yes, the same way. Yes, it's been a bit of a fight to get the authorities to let us in, but we are finally there and established. Um, and what we've had this so weekend the story is, for this week is? Uh, we sent Emily Ashton, one of our correspondents, up to Landudno in North Wales, which is a glamorous assignment to the UKIP conference where she found Suzanne Evans, who until this week was deputy chairman of the party, uh, telling UKIP activists not to talk about UKIP when trying to get people to vote to leave the EU. She said mentioning Nigel Farage is going to stop people voting leave the EU. And so Nigel Farage on Twitter is predictably outraged and Aaron Banks about this. I have to say Suzanne Evans, who again has reviewed the papers for us, and is, is, is a good egg by and large, but he's yeah. not much liked by Nigel Farage and vice versa. There's a, there, and Nigel Farage and the sort of that faction versus the Douglas Carswell and the Suzanne yeah. Evans faction. And this says a lot. We've got four months to go, but the Leave side still can't even agree what their message is. UKIP can't even agree what their message is, it seems, at the moment. So here we have Buzzcut, Buzzfeed, the future of d digital journalism. So you'd think newspapers were over, Alison. What is it? Is it a mad thing to launch a new newspaper at this point? Uh, it would be a mad thing to, 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 I think, to launch another just a newspaper, but we're trying to do something slightly different. This is going to be a very different type of newspaper that we're doing. Um, well, tell us a bit. We about are going to be so our key plank is we're having balanced opinion. So very much like on your show here, we're not going to be telling our readers what to think. Um, we believe that those days are sort of gone now, and that people want to have that balanced opinion from which they can draw their own conclusions. We thought the same on the Independent, Alison. It hasn't gone entirely according well, I don't, to plan. Well, but I don't necessarily <laughs> think that the balanced opinion was what perhaps yeah, was, was yeah, the problem. Yeah. Um, and then look at the success of I. Um, and then the other thing is we're also trying to take um, a more positive approach to life and report the good with the bad, as in as in life. That that's the way it goes. But as, as again, the, we found that one of the things was really causing lots of people to lapse out of newspaper readership was this relentless, um, relentless sort of negativity, de negativity and, and, and the idea and, and the way it's quite interesting, like the way Europe's been done in the papers today, this, these personalities where so what people at home are really interested in is the issues. What is the right thing to do about Europe and to help them form those and opinions? We, we, we should tell people that the name of the paper is... It's The New Day. The New and Day. It's, and it's, it's free tomorrow. It's free and then, tomorrow. And, and then for one day only. And when you um, say you're not going to take sides, when it comes to Brexit, will you say your readers should or should no, not? No, we wouldn't. You're, we wouldn't you're going to be completely we completely, from that. Very and, we would, and we would put those opinions out there, but with a lot of informed opinion from which people can draw their own conclusions. The same neutrality I'm sure we will see in the sun from you <laughs> done over the weeks and months Absolutely ahead. Absolutely the same <laughs> educative process for the, the readers, and um, I don't think we'll yeah. be... Yeah. giving an opinion for a while. Let's talk a little bit about the other big political story of the week because we've been watching the march and march and march of Donald Trump mm -hmm. and all the way through kind of the, the bien pensant London classes said it's okay, it's okay, they won't mm -hmm. really vote for him and then they do again and again and again. Mm -hmm. But he's now come up against uh, uh, Marco mm -hmm. Rubio mm -hmm. in a sensational and very, very foul-mouthed debate in America. And before we talk about it, I just want everyone to see this is Rubio having a go at Trump on the stump after that debate. He inherited $200 million. I said it last night. If he had not inherited $200 million right now, he would be selling watches in Times Square. You all have friends. You all have friends that are thinking about voting for Donald Trump. Friends, do not let friends vote for con artists. 
So it's kind of clear what mm. he thinks. But the, the march of Trump has taken everyone by surprise, hasn't it? Fair, fair enough to say, Tom? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the most extraordinary... Remember, two, three weeks ago, let alone months ago, Trump was a joke as, as far mm. as the commentary was having it. He, he would never even, you know, come in the top three or four of the Republican nomination. There is now serious thought that he's going to win the entire thing. Uh, and actually, I thought when you compare Hillary Clinton's uh, South Carolina acceptance speech last night, which was, you know, America isn't broken, we just need to make it whole again, the, 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 just the words, it doesn't come close to touching. It's the sort of raw victory. anger that's driving. Yes. Very, very good uh, yeah. spread, Jim, in, the, in yeah. the Sunday Times there, with all the facts you need. And also Trump with his, his wife there. One of the things that has most offended people about Trump mm. on this side of the water is what he said about women. He does seem mm. to have a very, very shall we say, old-fashioned view of these things. Yeah, and we at uh, BuzzFeed unearthed some old recordings last week where he sort of claimed he could have slept with Princess Diana if he mm. wanted to. I mean, this is the level of the guy. He's just going on bragging. But I've just come back from America, and uh, having been to a Trump rally, it's like nothing else. It's, um, it's in many respects awful, in many respects astonishing. It's a show. There's pumping music. There's a guy on stage. He's being, you know, sending out jokes. And the crowd absolutely love it. And it is this thing again where somebody who's regarded as a joke all of a sudden gathers that momentum yeah. <clears throat> and all of a sudden it's not at all funny anymore. Well, moving on from whether it's funny or not, the other huge American story I guess of the week we can't completely ignore is the Oscars mm. because um, we've got a lot of British talent in there but the big story seems to be the lack of black faces. Actually. Yes, I mean it's been a huge issue um, over the, uh, since the nominations came out about the lack of diversity but, but there's an interesting piece in the Sunday Times today, they've got an interview with Amy Pascal who was the boss of Sony, who had to resign after the, the leaked uh, emails, which, which showed about how women uh, actresses like Jennifer Lawrence were getting paid significantly less than, than men. And she's now come out and, and said it is an absolute travesty. And there's an amazing statistic, like only 3% of directors um, of, of movies are women. So there's a huge issue, um, both with women as well mm. as, as with black Absolutely. faces as well. And talking about the glitz, glitter and glamour of the film world, Tom, Borat, <laughs> yes, Borat and Grimsby, uh, a film which is apparently seeking to trash the reputation of one of our finest urban centres. And th that finest urban centre is not very happy about it either, it must no. be said. Uh, the Sunday we have a great little story uh, of uh, Sasha Bankang, the star of Grimsby, and of course Borat, uh, who would forget that mankini. Uh, so, where Tony Blair apparently told Sasha Bankang a few years ago uh, that the Prime Minister of Kazakhstan had rung Blair Percy and said, you must ban this film. It's going to kill our reputation internationally. He didn't actually help it, it has to be said. Uh, Tony Blair did, of course, turn that down and, and got on him for doing so. Very good indeed. Now, I want to turn full circle right. back to the EU and the very important subject of kettles. Very mm. important subject of kettles. Uh, there is Sunday Telegraph. A preposterous fear story that went around last week that uh, sourced to a UKIP MEP called David Coburn who said that the EU is trying to stop us having our toast by depowering our appliances. What it, we thought was a preposterous story, actually it seems, a Telegraph claim, there was some truth in it, and the EU has now shelved all the regulations to try and avoid all the stories that the mm. British papers love to pick up uh, on. So what so are they much. trying to achieve? Underpowered toast and underpowered kettles in British Yeah, Yep, they're coming mm. for the key values of the British society, our breakfasts, our, our <laughs> vacuum cleaners. They sometimes think that Nigel Farage must have sleepers inside <laughs> yeah. the commission. Uh, well, it's a, it was in, uh, in fairness. It was an energy saving yeah. idea, uh, yeah. a green thing. But uh, it does go to a slightly bigger truth across all of the government in the EU, which is almost nothing is happening now. Every major mm. decision, yes. be it on Trident, be it on the obesity strategy, uh, has S been. Snoopers Charter is being sneaked through, of course. Apart from one which absolutely has mm, to be which, done. Which, well, which is very interesting. So this is going to be rushed through, and by, by the end of April, it could all be done, regardless of the fact that just a month ago there was a committee saying that there was all sorts of concerns with it. We are all looking in one direction, they come round the other way. Mm. We like to finish on these newspaper reviews with a big truth, so thank you very much indeed to all of you.